Thank you. Thanks. Well, that's Good. Yeah, easy, easy. Welcome, man. Thank you. I think because we don't have mics or anything, we might have to. But everyone can hear, so I think we should be yeah. good. Yeah. Oh, well, you have a mic, so. Yeah. <laughs> it's just me that has to uh, be vocal. Mm -hmm. So take us back, my man. Um, Pretoria. Where, where were you born exactly? Yeah. Oh, before that, um, how are you guys doing? Um, I just want to thank you, each and every one of you guys, for coming through. Yeah. It means a lot to, um, I'm sure you guys come from work, you know, other commitments, but you made the time to come through today, you know? So I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming through. Um, so yeah, I was, I, was, I was actually born and bred in, in Pretoria. Um, I lived in Soshanguwe. I uh, did my primary school there. Then we later relocated to um, a village called Pake. It's outside Hammanskral, um, a few kilometers out, outside Hammanskral. Actually, one of my homeboys is here, Buipelo. Um, yeah, so uh, then I, I matriculated there in Mabote Senior Secondary School. Uh, relocated to Johannesburg in 2009 to further my studies. I'm an accountant by profession. So I've been in Joburg ah, for... Let's, let's get into that. So, so yeah, yeah. So how, how exactly, what made you go into accounting? Um, because I know you worked for PwC yep. for a couple of years. Um, what was it about the accounting field that drew you there? Had you always wanted to be an accountant growing up or was it like family pressure? Like, yeah. Ah, why not? I want yeah. you to be an accountant. Yeah. So it's, it's quite a beautiful story because um, like the family as well, you know, yeah. so where I come from, I'm, I'm that guy who broke the cycle from matriculating with distinctions, you know, the first guy to get a degree in the family. Uh, the first guy to literally start a business, you know, this big and whatever. So what inspired the move was actually, um, I love challenging myself. Um, and and it, it's, a, it's a simple thing that really got me into accounting. I love accounting, I love challenging it. You know the, the, um, uh, the narrative around, or the perception around accounting, that it's not such a cool subject to study. It's for boring it's people. For boring people, you know, it's <laughs> difficult. So I was like, I want to challenge myself. Yeah. So where I grew up, I don't know anyone who studied accounting, you know, um, except not, no, not in a bad way, but except myself. Mm. So that's where it all started. So when I looked around, everyone else wanted to be uh, nurses, mm. um, police, many uh, doctors, teachers, teachers yeah. and, 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 you know. So um, in my class alone, I was the only guy who wanted to pursue accounting. And actually, uh, my accounting teacher in high school told me that um, accounting is very difficult adversity mm -hmm. and getting in accounting is difficult so I should be careful when I pursue that. Yeah. Uh, and that's what inspired me to get into accounting. You know, from studying it, I liked the principles, you know, yeah. the ethics around accounting. Debit and credits. Debit and credits, <laughs> you know, uh, the values. So I just in, enjoy the, the psychology um, okay. uh, behind accounting. So, so that's what made me get into accounting. And then you studied that in job, like you said. And yes. Then within your studies, did you already think that you might one day start a business? Or was it just, you know what, I need to you know, work for the man, yeah, let me finish my studies, yeah. Then, just, uh, yeah. what, what, um, how was it that you first got into PwC, first of all, to get into that? And then, um, did you, while you were studying, have an inclination of, yeah, one day, I think I want to, yeah, I yeah. to study should come back? Sure. <laughs> Not, yeah, so, so very good question. So. The story behind business was that when I was pursuing my, uh, my undergrad yeah. in second year, um, I, I, was just, I just wanted to challenge myself. So I actually told my parents not to give me allowance anymore because I wanted to be independent. So myself and Andrew, who's my childhood best friend, uh, who's here now, um, so we came up with this idea that we want to get into business. You know, we were young, we wanted to earn some extra income. So we actually knew a guy called o -O Baltimore. But wait, wait, let's go back to the, 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 the part where you told your parents that you don't want yeah. to give you money. Sure. That, again, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, I'll explain <laughs> that. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm getting to that. So what happened was that, you know, at the time, I remember, I think it was 2011, yeah. uh, the, 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 the DJ's Boo breakfast show on YFM yes, I remember was big. It. So yeah. we were inspired and hyped by DJ's yeah. Boo at the time, you know, about pushing and hustling. Yeah. So we're like, we need to hustle as well. Yeah. We need to get into the road and hustle, right? So we knew this guy who sold um, Pocket Square and Cufflinks, Baltimore. right? Baltimore, yeah. who lived in 2nd Avenue in Alexandra. Okay. So we went to him, you know, because we didn't have uh, seed capital to start the business. Okay. So right. initially we wanted to go into fragrance or cosmetics. Okay. But we didn't have the, the seed capital to start the business. So we went to him, we're like, dude, we can actually sell this for you at a profit. 
and then you know give us a cost price stock on consignment we sell it we come and we pay you back and we keep the profit right so we did that up for about two months mm. then we we raised the seed capital so these were pocket squares and pocket squares cufflinks. it was a hamper oh the one with the, the colorful, colorful yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so we did that and then we made some a bit of some money from that yeah. then we went into cosmetics so we went and bought um um oil based perfumes yes. the reason for that is that we looked at the consumer behavior of our township economy which is alexandra we realized that people like looking good on weekends and sundays and it's smelling good, good yeah. but not everyone can afford a thousand rand perfume so what we then did was that we found a, a supplier who sold um uh, oil based perfumes mm. so we went there and then we we basically bought stock and sold oil based perfumes this the, is why we were still studying studying the beauty about cologne is that even when it's smelling good no one can tell if it's oil based or you bought it from wherever yes, so yes. so so we sold it and that's how we sort of got into business so to answer your question i would say that that's when the entrepreneurship or the entrepreneurial bug beat me so that's how i got into business and i fell in love with it sales you know um and then and yeah so i was doing undergrad um and selling that so I, all the time after class or after library we go door to door in alex we mm. sell perfumes it's a pity to say that some of the people still owe us the money now because we sell them credit <laughs> but well it was it was all lessons credit sales no no you know Ed, Ed Con didn't survive with credit sales so if you do get in business be careful with credit sales it doesn't work so, so yeah so this was just you and your, your boy Andrew yeah. at the time a bunch of guys in varsity just hungry for for, for to, to make a name for themselves sure now when you were doing all of this obviously you're still studying mm. where were you finding the balance between trying to study because i'm sure a lot of people even now maybe you're still studying or you are working or are working and studying or yeah or married and but during that time, you were still pushing to actually do something else. Yeah. So how did you manage to balance the two and still manage to progress to get hired by a big, one of the big uh, yeah. law firms, yeah. accounting firms? Um, so, so I think it's about the work ethic behind it. Mm. Everyone has got a mentor in business or in life and how you live your life and how you approach your professional life, you know, your career life. So it's about the values that you believe in. For me, it was pure hard work and sacrifice. And I never cared about anything else except making myself successful. So actually, for me to get into varsity, my dad sold his car sure. so that they can pay deposit for me so to get into varsity. Just deposit, not the whole year, deposit. So that I can at least go through the first semester. So leaving home in 2009, I knew where I come from. So I couldn't afford to sleep or to, wait, to, to not work. You so know what I'm saying? Your parents are back in the Texas. You yeah, you yeah. So that's my story. So that's one thing that really helped me, you know, to to to, to put in the work. So my ethics, my mantra, you know, and what I believed in it was just work, 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 work. You know, so it was it was just that. Yeah. yeah. And then, so now you get into the corporate world. Yeah. Um, how was that for you? Like, for for example, like a lot of people, that's what we're told when we're growing up. Mm. That's where you must go. You must get a good yeah. job, my son, yeah. my daughter. You know, uh, bring home the money. That, that's how we we all raised to follow that stream. Yeah. Um, my question is, when it happened for you, how how are your parents feeling towards that? Yeah. And then we'll get into how they felt when you said, you know, at Nasa sure. I'm going my own way. Yeah. Because I mean, they, as you said, they sacrificed, they sold the car to make yeah. sure that you go through all of this. Yeah. Um, so tell us about a little bit about. Your, your, your corporate life, how, yeah. how was that and um, your, your experience with, with you being overseas and everything, yeah. Yeah, so I think my parents got relieved. So, so when I was doing my second year, I got a buzzer. Um, and the buzzer was from Tomorrow Trust. So the business model for Tomorrow Trust is that they are um, a, a, a buzzer institution, put it that way, an NGO that offers buzzer to kids who are so affording. Yeah, yeah, so I'm getting to that part. Okay. So the model is that they get kids studying from different fields. They go to corporates, you know, and approach corporates to sponsor a kid in the organization in return that the kid will work for them. So with the hard work that I've put in my first day because of I knew where I was coming from, fortunately I got good results. I got into PwC in the, um, in, 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 I mean, to, to Tomorrow Trust, yeah. and I became the top achiever of the year. PwC came through, it's like we're looking for an accounting student. And obviously, who's the top achiever in accounting? 
Theo is. <laughs> so, so lucky now because of the hard work that I've put in, in, in the first year. So when, when PwC came looking for a kid to sponsor, yeah, because yeah, remember it's yeah. their repetition. So they need to get someone that they can trust. Lucky enough, my first year I did well. So they, that's how I got it to PwC. PwC sponsored me. By default, immediately when I graduated, went straight to PwC. To answer your question, my parents started being relieved from that point when I said I got a bursary, you know, until my owners postgraduate. So they're kind of, okay, cool, you know what I'm saying? So it was a huge relief from their end. Uh, journey into PwC, uh, beautiful journey. Uh, it's been a five year journey. I uh, learned a lot. Um, so we did a lot of rotation within departments, did anything from auditing, um, finance and accounting, to asset management, to strategic consulting, you know, different things, you know. But when I left, I was, ma I was majoring in asset management. Okay. Yeah. So when you were there, were you uh, doing your articles or mm. you were part of the, the, the team there? Yeah. And then how, how did you find the experience of being in corporate? Were you always, I think it goes back to, 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 to having started the, business, the small business that you mm. guys had in Varsity. Mm. Did you still think of, at this time when you were in PwC, were you still selling the perfumes? Or were you still in yeah. consignment in Baltimore? <laughs> when did that fall out? Like, I know, second year shop, perfume, I've got a job now. And unfortunately, the reality of a situation for a, this is the reality, for a 23-year-old who just got, I mean, an employment, I mean, started working for a great firm. When you move, salary brackets move. You move from an allowance to a nice salary, with travel allowance, you know? So you see money that you've never seen before, you know? Salary that you've never seen before. So the reality of the situation is the hunger sometimes dies in terms of entrepreneurship, then you're in this corporate life, you know? And then you start getting, life starts changing a bit. You start buying a car, a first car, you know? So the entrepreneurship side, you know, I, I lost track of that. But the good thing is that I focused on the corporate life. So that's where I got the technical skills, the values, you know? So yeah, that's what happened with me. So my first year of, pre of, of, of my professional life, I didn't do any business. It was just like work, 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 yeah. And then second year? Second year, still work, because I mean, unfortunately in consulting, a lot of people will relate. You've got a lot of projects, yeah. and you travel a lot, you know, um, internationally and, and, and domestically as well. So sometimes, you know, you don't, have, and it's not an excuse, but because of the nature of the work, and the, the crazy nights and the late nights, you don't have enough time to pursue that, you know? My question, um, I think, comes back to, when, when all of this was going on, how, how, or let me rather ask, why were you not, like how most people are. Why were you not like, no, Moskisha, come on, PWC. You know, I've got the job with allowance. Ah, Joe, like, Kisha, boy, like. Um, and I'm sure, you yeah. know, going back to your parents as well, you've got a good job now, you had the bursary, like, they're happy, my son. Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Uh, I think it's more of a, it's, it's a personal question as to who you are as a person. I hate comfort. That's why maybe um, I struggle with relationships, because... <laughs> uh, that's why maybe I struggle with relationships, but uh, I, I hate comfort. Uh, no, no, <laughs> that's just who I am. Uh, I, I don't like a comfort um, a sort of cycle or a way of living, you know. Um, so after two years, you're used to everything now. You're used to the travel, you're used to the money, you're used to whatever. And life becomes like you wake up morning, you know, there's a new project, then a Monday morning for the next three months, you know, you, you, you station at this client, and then you wrap up the project, deliverables done, then you get your salary, you get your allowance, then life is sort of a routine. So I got sort of tired of that. And um, obviously you get woke as you travel as to how other people are living and the importance of entrepreneurship, township economics, you know. So in PwC we call it, um, um, globalization. So, so as you go out, it started being expressed as to, you start being exposed to other avenues of living or other avenues of business. So that thing awoke me, you know, to say we need to start something, you know, we need to start something. So after my second year, that's when I started Batu. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And then how would you say, because um, I know you had some overseas travels within sure. uh, your time in PwC, mm -hmm. how would you say that affected you? I, I hear you saying, that was part of what started to wake you up as to say, sure. yo, that something must happen. But um, how critical would you say that is? So that's my first question. And the other one, with the knowledge that you gained from PwC, how critical would you say uh, 
uh, working in a corporate is for starting your own business, for example. Is it, yeah. is it critical? Um, did it help you in any way yeah. when you eventually now decided, yeah, you know what, let me go back into this entrepreneurial thing. Yeah. So, the travel and then... The travel and that. So, my view is that with me, before the travel, so, I, like earlier on, I, t- I spoke about um, your mantra in business or in life and, and your values and your belief system. So, going back to where I started, my belief in anything in life is that you maximize on opportunities. Parents never had money, but I had an opportunity to get into varsity for the first six months. Maximize that, got a bursary. Maximize the first day, got a uh, sponsor by PwC. Got into PwC, maximize that by working well with managers and whatever, then got a Dubai gig. Do you know what I mean? So from where it started, never under- undermining opportunities. So I think it's critical, in a sense, going back to travel, it's critical in a way that you, your mind sort of opens up um, and you learn other cultures and other ways of living. So, and economies are different. The, the, the township economy or the Johannesburg economy is not the same economy as in Dubai or in UK or in New York, right? So the way of trading is no longer, it's not, it's not the same as well. So simple things, I mean, when you're overseas, you go to a restaurant, you know, I mean, um, and, and then you get exposed to how it thinks. The way Yoko was found, Yoko, the device, the founder was overseas and then he was, he was at the restaurant and they brought this small device to pay and he was like, what is this? That's what inspired Yoko. Yoko today is one of the best startups in Africa because of traveling. So if he was not in that restaurant, he probably would never have this idea. So when you get exposed to different economies from restaurant business, you know, so your mind sort of opens up, right? Um, the second question was about... Um, so being in corporate, how has that helped? Help me. And is it necessary to think to be able to have yeah. Like, you know, yeah. has it given you an edge, edge for yeah. someone who hasn't worked in yeah. corporate? Personally, yes, it did. Because, um, um, number one, your rules of engagement in corporate are different. I'm sure you've seen how I've, I, I communicate with you via email from being here. You know, the way you engage with your clients, you know, the way you engage with your colleagues, the way you engage with um, 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 uh, prospective investors or wherever, you know. So the way you engage yourself, corporate will teach you a lot of soft skills. The technical part, it's obviously we differ. There's civil engineers, there's medical doctors, there's accountants, there's lawyers. Technicalities are different. But one thing guaranteed, the soft skills you will never get elsewhere without corporate. Because in corporate, there's an organogram, there's hierarchy, there's a way of communicating, there's a way of engaging, you know? Um, So whereas if you don't have that experience, you will talk however with people, you know? You won't be able to communicate efficiently two ways of receiving, of communication. There's a sender, there's a receiver. Those little things. So those are the things that you get exposed to. At PwC, we had a PwC business school, whereby if you're not booked on a project, you would go for training. You know, you would go for training for anything. Simple things like, um, I remember we also had Microsoft uh, skills, and it, it had levels, you know, until advanced, advanced Microsoft skill, um, uh, Excel skills, you know. So those type of things, you would never get anywhere, you know, w- without actually taking, you know, uh, or being in corporate. So for me, there was a lot of value. Another thing that I learned a lot, project management. Actually, a lot of people um, uh, overlook corporate uh, project management. Project management is a big thing in business. Um, there's actually a course for it, specifically for project management, you know. So for me, I, I think it has given me a quite a good edge. So how do you think project management has helped you in your business? To corporatize the business, okay. to lead the team, okay. uh, to work on projects, yeah. time frames, deliverables, assigning teams, yeah. you know, all of that. I mean, um, just this year, we, we just started corporatizing the business now. Before then, Batu was a one-man back office. I had a lot of people in operation, but the back office was just Theo from finance, HR, operation, marketing, whatever. But only now that we're starting to corporatize and we've got an HR person, a finance person, you know, strategy, marketing, and whatever, you know? So with the experience that I've had in, in corporate, I've, 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 I've been able to implement that into my business. Let's, let, let's backtrack then. To yeah. Now you're there, you pick up to see, um, why shoes? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are um, so many things, um, and I understand, you know, from the perfume that yeah. was, you know, the hustling there. But shoes, I think, is a very specific market. Like it's yeah. a very. I, I don't know whether my question then is to say, do you have any fa- like history with fashion in your family mm. or things like that? No, you know, like, 
Yeah, not even. I've got a, I've got a history in my family of selling. Okay. And I'm passionate about that. I'm passionate about people. I'm passionate about selling. But to answer your question, so 2015, I'm on a project with a Saudi electricity company, uh, which is the ESCOM of Saudi Arabia. I um, booked on that project for about 18 months. And I'm traveling quite often to between South Africa, Dubai, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and, and Doha. Uh, so that's the journey. Like literally, I'm here one week and I'm overseas three weeks. Uh, Andrew complains that uh, he doesn't see me often or mm. stuff like that, right? So um, one, one evening, I remember it was an evening flight. Yeah. I'm off to Saudi Arabia, but connecting via Dubai. Then I don't know how, in PwC we had our own travel agency that booked us. Someone somewhere missed, missed my, my flights. Yeah. Or maybe they never had flight op other flight options except that one. I, was, I, I, was, I had a seven hour layover at Dubai airport. This was before launch access, meaning that I had to roam around Dubai airport for seven hours. Yeah. By default it worked for me. So I'm walking around the retail store, the, the duty free yes, section. Yes. And then I walk into the store. It's a French owned store. Lucky enough, at the time, the owner was there for a store visit. We started giving me a chat, and I tell him I'm from South Africa, this is where I am, and I started learning about his brand. Mm -hmm. So one thing on my connection flight, one thing that I took away from the conversation was that his, his, his brand was from France, mm -hmm. and he spoke to the French community or people from France. He told their story in Dubai airport. And I was like, wait a minute. What are we doing as Africans to tell our own stories to the world? We are such a diverse um, country or continent with different cultures, different stories. What are we doing to tell our own stories? Number one, I'm, 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 in, I'm in corporate at the time. I'm passionate about selling and I'm a sneakerhead. And there's a saying that says, if you consume too much of it, then why not own it? I'm buying a lot of sneakers at the time, limited edition Jordans from Dubai, come to South Africa, my friends say, look, oh, those are cool limited editions. Where did you get them from? I can't find them in Rosebank. I can't find them in Sensen, right? Then, then I realized that there is a need for sneakers. And then there's a need to telling story, right? So I combined the two factors. And then when I did my research, which um, the research, research and development for Batu, proof of concept, quality controls, quality assurance, you know, it took me 18 months. Then when I did a research, I actually found out that for, inst for instance, we've got seven continents. You look at South America, um, they've got two major brands, shoe brands. That is Ipanama and Havanians, that are specifically from Brazil. You go to North America or to the States, they've got Nike and they've got All Star, that was started by a guy called Chuck Taylor, uh, later sold to Nike. And then you go to Europe, they've got Puma and Adidas, and they've got a lot of many shoe Italian shoe brands. One of them was Spitz. Speeds in 1994, they only had one store in Carlton Center. Now they've got a lot, many years later. Then you go to Australia, they've got ASICs, they've got, I think, Vans as well. Um, and I went back to our continent, Africa. I was like, all of those names that I've mentioned, let's benchmark them here. Mm -hmm. Can I get one name, one shoe brand from this continent that can be benchmarked with the shoe brands? I couldn't find any. Don't we wear sneakers in Africa? We do. Where are they from? Don't we have a story to tell? Did my research to find out what Ipatu, the word Ipatu, originated from the days of apartheid, way prior democracy, meaning shoe. It was used in the total days to refer to a shoe. And that is one word that connects us. You don't have to speak in the Bele, Su, to Swat, because I to understand what it means. All the township. And this is a beautiful story. So I was like, wait a minute. I've lived with, I've worked with incredible people, the minority per se. And I know how they think. They look at the black person, the consumer behavior, what he eats, what he drinks. They conceptualize brands around that. They sell it back to you. Example, they come to our communities, look at um, basically parties, marriage, I'm a society. A black person does bry meat, cook pop, chakalaka, and they call that chisanya. They go, OK, cool. We're going to brand this, trademark it, Store. Put it in a store and send it back to them. Who buys Chisanyama? Us. Who does it belong to? You know? So I was like, wait a minute. They go, we're going to do the same in your part. Mm. Let me jump on it. And that's, that's what inspired the concept. We need to build a proudly South African shoe brand. 
um, telling a proudly South African story. So, so, so that's what inspired, basically. So explain to me, and maybe those who also don't understand, the, the idea behind a proof of concept. What sure. Is it, what does it, a proof of concept actually entail? Um, what, like, what is it for, for yeah. like, the layman's on the screen? Sure. And then also, after doing the, the, the research, because I, 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 I take it you're doing this, like after hours, Nyana, sure. after span, with, uh, with PwC resources. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Now yeah. they know. Now they know. <laughs> <laughs> that busted. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so uh, the, the balancing of you're working, you're trying to start this mm -hmm. proudly South African shoe brand, presumably after hours, and then also, um, you know, how, how do you get to that, that stage where now you feel okay it's, it's it's enough i can now jump ship yeah yeah okay so proof of concept basically that's one of the technicalities that i learned from pwc so you'll have a lot of people in project in corporate understand this when you're working on a major project you would necessarily have a proof of concept done with a pilot project just to test it as to whether it works and when you apply it at large then you just go all out you deploy it everywhere so for me I was testing a lot of things. Uh, do people need sneakers in, in our country? Do they need locally manufactured sneakers? Are they willing to pay 900 rand, 1,002 for sneakers? All of those elements. So that was the importance of doing a proof of concept, right? And also for me was, um, I got declined 16 times by the faction in Durban because the main reason was that our, proto, our flagship design, the mesh edition, is made out of mesh material. In the, in the shoe business, mesh material mostly is used as a component of a shoe, not to do the whole shoe of it. So I, I was declined because they believed it's impossible to do it. Until I flew to Devon to meet the owner, uninvited, to pursue. And I was like, oh, this is the man who keeps us bothering us with emails and stuff. <laughs> and for that, they said, we're going to do 100 pairs for you, yeah. right, as a proof of concept. Okay. If you sell these units, then we know you've got a business. But they charge so, you for those? Yeah, yeah, they charge me for that. Okay. Yeah. So they charge me for it, and then that's how the business started and the importance of, of proof of payment, of, of proof of concept. So proof of concept yeah. is more like research and development. Research and development, in a way, yeah. Okay. And then your question was how I get to. So the balancing, the working, yeah. and then trying to do this, yeah. sending all these emails yeah. with the company resources. Yeah. So how, how, do, how did you find the balance, uh, if any, to, to make sure that you got to the point where mm. it was ready? And then also, how, what led to you eventually then saying, I'm going to quit my 9 to 5 yeah. and I'm going to start this thing full time? Initially, it was the plan. Any other person who, who are in corporate or who have been in corporate, they will tell you this. There is, there is an exit strategy. You got to have an exit strategy if you want to get out of corporate. You know, you can't just be in corporate and think that one day you will. Everyone's got their own exit strategy to say. But most people's exit strategy is retirement, you know? That's still an exit strategy. <laughs> <laughs> it's still, sorry, they're different. Some exit strategy is going to business. Some is just working until you direct an executive and you take a big package. Still an exit strategy, you know, and there's nothing wrong with it. So my exit strategy was that business. So initially when I started it, I knew why I was starting it. So that it can be my exit strategy, right? So I worked on it, and then it was a one-man show for the longest of time. You know, after hours, obviously, I used to work. Like I said, I used PwC's a laptop, PwC's internet, you know, infrastructure to build this business after, after hours, basically. And then that's how it started. And then obviously, when the business grows, you use your guts. You know, I, I left a tax-free salary in, in, in the Middle East, in Dubai, you know. Um, and, and then I went straight into business, and then it was guts. It, it got to a point where the business was growing. I needed to make a choice. Yeah. Actually, Andrew told me that you need to make a choice, bro, like as to whether you're going to come and join us or you stick in Dubai, because the business is growing, the workload is growing, and then we need you here. Yeah. So, this is now, the proof of concept has been approved, you've, got, you've sold out the 100 pairs. How did you get to that point? Um, I guess my question, it's also two questions, is to say, were you behind the design of the shoe? Mm -hmm. Because it's quite a unique design. Yeah. Um, What's your tagline? The only shoe that we sure because you you don't find any shoe like that anywhere, even overseas. Sure. Um, so now, was that your own design? Were mm -hmm. you sitting one day? Hey, is it? Yeah. That's who knows that she's like. I yeah. A shoe that just sure. Sure. And then um, 
how was your marketing strategy to first to sell that first hundred pair? Because mm. that was a lot of capital I can imagine coming from you. Yeah. Um, what guarantee did you have that you were going to be able to sell that first hundred? Yeah. And then, which then led you to, to, to doing it full time. Yeah. And I made a loss on that on, on that hundred pairs, sure. a big loss. Some people still still owe me money for it. But then the objective was never it's to the make same money. People with <laughs> <the perfume. laughs> no, different people. <laughs> But anyway, the idea was never, you know, when you're passionate about something, like you yeah. just want to see it working. It, it was not about making money. So um, the design itself, the mesh edition, I was sitting there and I did a lot of research. So before I launched the business, I, I did 18 months. Proof of concept, quality control, quality assurance, back and forth proposals with the factory and whatever. So what inspired the design was that it was in 2015, there was a happy socks trend. So when I did the research, and I obviously, I mean, there's certain models that I looked at, you know, uh, existing models. Like, for instance, Lokshan Culture. Mm -hmm. They were telling a part of the story. I looked at how they, in my opinion, in my views, I actually met Uwandi, Uwandi, yeah, yeah, yeah. and Zimande, one of the founding members of Lokshan Culture. For my view was that Lokshan Culture had a story, mm -hmm. but they never had the innovation. So you look at their, their most selling shoe, which is the All-Star design. They literally took the All-Star design, took a logo, put it there, and it told a beautiful story, and we loved it, you know? And at that time, there was a hype of YFM booming in, quiet was going on. This was before celebrities could know that you can endorse, you know? People just wore election culture, whatever, and it became a culture, and we loved it. But the problem about it is that there was no innovation. So, 2015, I looked at the trend, and I was like, happy socks, such a cool thing. Skinny's boo was on it as well, you know, pushing, and I was like, this is beautiful. But one thing that I identified, the problem with that, and I think this is where the... the, the the idea came from being different. Everyone when you're wearing happy socks, it's either when you're wearing a, a short, then I can see your happy socks. Or when you're wearing a jean or whatever, long trouser, when you sit down, I can see your happy socks. So how about that we create a happy shoe, number one? A shoe that can be happy. You look at it, oh, that's a happy shoe. Number two, how about that you build a shoe that can show off your happy socks? So that's where the mesh edition came from, because it's a see-through. Number three, I mean, there's different issues around shoes. Some people smell feet, some people, sometimes it, it, there's too much heat in your, in your sneakers. Then why not create an environment where there's air or ventilation in the sneaker? So those were my three components of this design. So obviously I'm an accountant by profession. I can't draw to save my life. I got a good guy, a graphic guy to do it for me. I explained the concept, submitted to a factory. They declined me 16 times. Sure. On yeah. the same design? On the same design. We did 21 samples for that with the quality testing. But what were you thinking when you keep getting the... Like, I mean, after the third time, guys, I don't know about you. Yeah. I'm like... I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, yes, pick up the CD. Yeah, I think, I think, like, one thing that I've learned about business, about guts, actually, not even about business, I think about anything in life, your guts will never, will never lead you or mislead you with anything, whether it's personal, work, you know? So I think my guts were just telling me. I, don't, I asked myself, too, how did I... How did I, I don't know. But my guts, I was just on it, you know, on it, on it, on it, on it, on it, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I think also maybe it helped because of I was not doing it full time. It's not like I wanted to do this and then in the morning when I wake up, I'm pitching this thing and then I get declined. The whole day I get declined for 16. No, no. I wait. Later on I will drop that email or during lunch I'll drop that email. I'll go decl I get declined. I leave them for a week or two. <laughs> then I'm in the inbox again, you know? So it helps. But I think maybe if I did it full time, Pursuing them full time was going to be a different story, you know? Do yeah. you think you would have still got in a year if you hadn't flew down to pick the owner? No. They still tell me today. Yeah, they don't miss my calls now. <laughs> <laughs> Every time you go there. Yeah, they don't miss my calls, yeah. Um, so this factory, obviously not to go into too much detail. Yeah. Are they solely making Batu now or are they... No, no. Are they shoe manufacturers? They're shoe manufacturers, 50, 56 years plus experience. Wow. Uh, family business, uh, Indian owned. Um, so yeah. how did you find them? You just Google the... Uh, actually, I got a reference from one of my colleagues in PwC okay. when I explained the idea and I was speaking. Yeah. So now I know um, a friend of mine from Devon, they own this factory, so maybe there's a contact, that type of thing. Network, basically. Yeah. yeah. And then 21 times later, 16 to 10 yes. times later, yeah. 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 you said yes when you finally got there. Finally got there. Yeah. Um, we did the proof of concept 2016. 6 September 2016, we launched the brand. Within four hours, our website crashed because of traffic or frequent uh, visits to the website. People were like, oh, this is, what's this? You know, there was so much hype. And then literally three, I think, you no, know, two months later, yeah. we got approached by Jane Beehive. Um, Jane Beehive is an incubation in Johannesburg. Wow. 
uh, they're like, this is so cool, let's do a collaboration. You know, so they just wanted to fund my business. And from there, one thing led to another, one thing led to another. So they gave me a thousand pairs, they boosted my business, didn't pay anything from that. I did, man I manufactured, we did a collaboration with them, and then we sold a thousand pairs. Obviously, took the money, reinvested, bought the first car, take the money. You know, now we were storing the shoes in Alex, in Andrew's room. Yeah. Then now, obviously, so the stock is... In with boxes. <laughs> with the boxes. Yeah. So obviously now we're getting more stock, then yeah. his room is no longer enough. Moved to warehouse in Sunning Hill, you know, mm -hmm. got a bigger space and then it's basically a, a place called self storage. Yes, it's like yes, units. Yes. We got the second unit, the you third unit, the unit, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. Bought the second real vehicle, and got two more guys to help in the business. So yang you know, yeah. then it sort of grows, yeah. So So I'm hearing the critical part there as well. What, what what impact do you think the deal with JMB Hive had, mm. and also coming back from a marketing point of view, do you think you would be where you are now had that not happened? Especially the injection of the capital to yeah. be able to to push the brand as yeah. much as it did, and then the power of social media and the internet. How did that factor into where your brand is currently, and, yeah. and how it grew? and it's continuing to grow, right? Yeah. Look, Jane Beehive was a great help, I won't lie. But remember the time I was still working. So, so Batu, I used all my money, all my five-year savings to start it, and I was still working. So shouldn't have, maybe Jane Beehive came through, yeah. I would have still used my money to sustain the business because it took me a while. You know, even after using my money, it took, Andrew knows this, it, I mean, for us to be, for the business to be self-sufficient because of cash flow is a problem. So I think my work really helped finance the business or the other way around. So it's either I'm out of cash or the business out of cash. So, so, so if I'm hearing correctly, so yeah. you got you there, you were making losses initially? Not, not entirely. Okay. Not entirely. I was making profit, but because of there's a lot of operational costs as well, you know? Or sometimes you, you want to place a big order, but you don't have enough capital, or you haven't sold enough stock and stuff like that. So you need to pump in your own cash, those type of things, you know? But then, to answer your question, to save the stress of cash flow, JNB Hive came through. You know, then it really helped us a lot because a thousand pairs that I didn't even spend a cent on, you know, and that's profit. Basically, it's like free profit. Yes. Yeah, because we're trending at the time even. Mm. So the stock moved fast. We moved a thousand pairs very fast and then we reinvested the proceeds, you know. So it really, really helped. Yeah. So the power of marketing, mm -hmm. what impact do you think that's had on your business? And how, how much would you factor things like social media and mm. whatnot? Um, our business is basically mainly was built on social media and because of the research and development that I've done so I was a one-man business for the longest of time so I would do everything when I say research and development I would do anything from marketing to finance to brand positioning I mean at the time when I was doing that Skinny's Boo was doing very well mm. you know what I'm saying at the time so I, I learned a lot of things uh, Theon Gobeni uh, with Slim Feed was doing his thing you know so those 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 people they really helped me position my brand better then I realized that storytelling is key you know, so um, influencers are key. So we've been very fortunate with the business that we've actually never paid any celebrity to endorse us. Mm -hmm. They love the story, they love the design, and they put us through, you know. And so the power of social the media, yeah. Themselves, yeah. The power of social media, the power of storytelling mm -hmm. is very key because of now, you, you can do this thing, you, like you can literally sell in, in England while you're in South Africa, you know, through social media. And it really helps, it really helps, I won't lie, yeah. So you touched on influencers there. Um, where do you see the industry of influencers going now within, within, within the way that the mm. social media has now um, sort of taken over our lives? Yeah. 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 Like you say, you've never had to pay because obviously now it's like a big industry. People get paid just to yeah. put up one picture. And yeah. Whatnot. Yeah. So where do you see that? Uh, I think it's going to end up being like an industry on its own. They're going to, uh, if, if possible, there's probably going to be uh, master classes on how to be an influencer. Because it really works. I won't lie for, for businesses that see value in it. Well, businesses are different. You know, some businesses, they don't really, social media is not a thing. They've got their own traditional marketing routes or mechanisms. Um, but for the nature of the business that I mean, social media uh, works and influencers works, you know, with the right people, the right audience, the right target. I mean, for us, and this is, this is, this is the, the truth, if some easy post about Batu now, we get busy for two weeks. Straight on. Do you know what I mean? So, so it works big time. We get people calling in saying we want this music shoe. <laughs> yeah, honestly. 
can I have a tissue there? Just uh, yeah. Up, yeah. So yeah, you get busy for two weeks. That's why I was asking yeah. that. Thanks, bro. I'm, Thanks, I'm, I'm not sure if everyone's aware. I also just recently found out about the whole um, industry of influencers because these celebrities have now become influencers. Yeah. Big brands rely on them. Like now, I think Casper and your best has a deal with Samsung. Samsung, yeah. So things like that, I, I've seen now play a big part. Yeah. And um, even myself, I think, had it not been from seeing your shoe here and there, mm. um, it, 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 it brings it to the market. Yeah. So my quick question before we wrap up and then get the audience to maybe ask a, a, a couple of questions as well. In Dubai, you're pricing, my man. Sure. Oh, <laughs> I'm so, I'm so, yeah. you've uh, had many interesting. Yeah. Uh, I've got good friends around that. Yeah, yeah. bring it on. Yeah, no, 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 definitely. <laughs> yeah. So, I want to get into uh, the, the issue of pricing and uh, pricing margins a little bit and, um, and, and talk to, to, to the, the deeper aspects of the business now mm. as to what it is that you think is a good pricing strategy. Is it coming in at a high price so that the perception is that, you know what? If it's this price, then mm. clearly yeah, it's, it's the real deal. But then how do you counter that high price with people not knowing your brand? Mm. Because people are used to like Bonai, yeah. or whatever, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, what do you say to someone, for example, who'd say, Ash, I'd rather buy a Nike mm. than buy a badge? Mm. Mm. I think number one, there's a reason why we, why we got declined 21 times. There's a reason why we did pro concept for 18 months. There's a reason why we did um, 21 samples. 21 samples. Not that we never got the shoe right. We got the design as is on a 3D design, but the quality was not right. And every sample came with a cost so that we can sort of get it at the right scale. In terms of quality control, there's different scale. So all the time, the results when it come from the machine would never meet the scale. Hence, we did the 21 sample so that we made the right scale of quality and testing and control, right? Number one. Number two. Um, the thing about pricing, business owners is about making profit, right? But regardless, if, 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 you, if you use pricing as a marketing tool so that people can think it's of quality, the reality of the situation is that you can put your price here, but if there's no value on it, people are going to eventually realize that actually this is 1200 but then after a month or two, you say, 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 you know? So what's going to happen to the brand? Yeah, I say, you know? <laughs> Then what's going to happen to the brain? You know, people are going to pick it up, you know? And then especially, one thing that I've realized about consumers, especially South African consumers, we've got a lot of support. A lot. Don't get me wrong. A lot of support. I but, hear but, yeah. <laughs> but, right? People really want the shoe. And they like quality. So either way, ne? If, if, if you're not on par on quality, people are going to walk away from you. That's one thing that I've got to understand, right? But if your quality is great, people are going to keep on coming, right? So with me, when I told you earlier on about the research that I've done, Nike and whatever, I benchmarked everything. Branding, positioning, storytelling, pricing, and whatever, right? Including location culture on that. One of the big, actually, one thing the man who confessed this to me. He was like, there's one thing that you got right, was your pricing. Location culture, obviously because of the pricing mechanisms, were, the pricing scale was low. The quality was not that great, number one. So what they've done is that because they were manufacturing cheaper with the lower quality, they sold it for cheaper. But what they've opened up is that they opened the counterfeit market. Mm. So, Luxon Culture, you would go to Edgar's, you'd get it at 400. You would go a pen in Alex, you'd get it for 370. You would get it in a store, in a Chinese store, for 360, 350. So, you can't tell, the pricing does not even distinguish the two. So, consumers and MX, Nike, Nike clients, mm. MX, a vapor, I think it's about 2000 or something like that. A Nike consumer who's willing to buy, who's willing to afford, they go to town, they get an MX for 600, they won't buy it. They won't buy it, right? But if an MX was 600 and the Chinese sold it at 600, Chinese don't like expensive things. So even they can do a counterfeit, they will never sell Batu for 1,002. So a, a willing buyer for Batu who can afford and who really wants a Chinese Batu, when they get it on the street, right? For 400, they would know by default that uh, maybe there's something fishy here, you know, that type of thing. So when I did research, I found that pricing is key, not only because of it's too high or whatever, but if you benchmark your quality against uh, your price against quality, people are gonna come for you, and they're gonna be able to separate between your counterfeit and the original one. And then, so I think you've answered the question of 
someone says now they want they'd rather buy mm. a, a, a Nike than a Batu. So you, is is your proposition that it's it's you're selling the story mm -hmm. and the fact that there's the quality mm -hmm. and the, the history of the testing mm -hmm. and the research and development. Yes. But what do you then say to because as you would have also maybe experienced, we are very brand conscious in this yeah, country. Sure. So before getting your shoe to where it is now in terms of being easily recognizable, mm. how did you break past the, the, the thing of people not knowing the shoe mm. but then also being able to pay for that price? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Good question. So actually let me tell you a story. So we hustle so easy. <laughs> and like we hustle him like in the morning, five AM Sisem Metro, you yeah. know? He doesn't know us. Yeah, I was thinking some other hustling, but it's okay. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> not that, not that hustling. <laughs> so we drive to Metro in the morning, and we're like, we want some music to wear the shoe. The naked DJ comes. You know, in Metro, like, you can't have access because of access tax, whatever. So naked comes in. He says, hey, naked, shop, 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 shop. No, we're looking for some music, but we can't get through. So, okay, cool. We're zombies, man. Yeah. Then access tag, then Naves goes through and calls me. This guy's outside, you know? Mm. Ah, so music being humble comes through. Like, well, sure, I hear you guys here for me. Okay, elevator pitch. Mm. This is who I am. This is what I'm trying to tell. This is my product. He looks at it and goes like, okay, can I have a pink and a, and a blue? Try them on, sharp. Then obviously, it's a pushy business. Mm. I mean, you know, we're trying to take a picture. Mm. But so means, no, can you take a picture? No, I said, no, no, no. If I like it, I will post it. Ish. Shang a poem, no picture. <laughs> Yo. I am fine, the airport's yeah, all I gone. What if then... Yeah, what if he leaves it? <laughs> what if he leaves it at Metro or and then he gives it to the cousins and whatever and the airport's work saying, you know? Yeah. You know how celebrities are, just yeah. gives it to your cousins or whatever. I like it now. Yeah. Then one day, I think it was Devon July, so Mizu rocks the, the pink one. Yo. And he takes us, yeah. right? And then all the time when we have moved, we keep on giving him compliments and repairs, right? So one thing that he told us, like, you know, Ipato, I've worn it and I like the quality, yeah? And the thing about it, the quality, if you consider, if you focus on the quality and the deliverance of the shoe, you're gonna go far, this was his advice, was that marketing is more of a word of mouth. So when people, you know, wear a shoe, they like a shoe, they're gonna sell for you, they're gonna market for you. That's the most, you can do social media, you can do advertisement, if, but if there's no one speaking anything about your brand, you know? they not gonna and that 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 is the whole value chain we struggled a lot with savings because our demand was here and we never anticipated that so our savings sometimes we've 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 disappointed people but we're trying to work on it um but in terms of the shoe itself and how people the experience of the shoe people will go like look that it, it, it took me some time to get the shoe i struggled to get the shoe but hey man it's a good shoe do you know what i mean it's worth the price so that thing that's what contributed to the success of the business, to the price. And then very, very, you're gonna refer someone, they're gonna buy it, they're gonna have the same experience. You know, some people will say it's a lighter shoe, it's comfortable, it's quality. Then there, that's what build the brand. Then, the next thing, no one questions the price anymore. You feel me? But it takes time. Just like how yeah. Nike and them, no one questions. No one questions. 2000 brand Nike. Is no, like, yeah. yeah. Because of the, the... You know what you get. Yeah, the brand identity that they've built. Nike will never disappoint you with quality. I personally, I'm not one Nike for the longest of time. Same applies with All Star. They will never disappoint in quality. Hence, those series of quality assurance that we went through. Because I knew that some people might be skeptical with the price. But with time, you wear it, you refer to the next person. The next person wears and they enjoy it. You know, those type of things. So you sort of build a value chain around that. Before you know it, Solonji party at 10,000 and people, because of their identity, they will buy it. <laughs> no, just kidding. That's yeah, not our brand positioning. <laughs> no, no, we're not going that way. But what I'm saying is that eventually after 15 years of existence, you know, we're going to be able to get to a point whereby pricing is no longer um, a problem. So obviously like Nike, the pricing is different from Gucci and Louis. They've got a, a, a bracket of where the prices play around. So, so we're also going to have a bar to bracket after some time. And then pricing like will... an entry level one. Yeah, one. sure, sure. Um, I think, yeah, that for me, that's... Thank you. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. so, uh, I'll head it over to the floor and then back to you to then finish to tell us what the plans you have sure. uh, for bar two what products you are in the pipeline yeah. after that and uh, yeah, anything else that you would like to impart. Maybe this video goes out to some kid sure. 
Bako Alex, Ben, yeah. or Sosh. Yeah. And then I go on and then Grabo, like, more LinkedIn, he has no hope, maybe. Yeah, true. He's sitting and, and he doesn't have examples around him of mm. what's possible. Mm. Um, so I'd like you, after maybe we'll take three questions mm. to end us off with uh, that, that. Yeah, uh, sure. So, I don't know, any question, guys? <laughs> There's a lot. <laughs> yeah. There's a question there. Oh, the corner there. Thank you. Um, I think the story behind the shoes is fantastic. Sure, thanks. And I also like the fact that it's, it's local. And, and, you know, it's big job. Sure. You know, uh, the one question I have, well, two questions. Um, firstly, uh, from your story, it didn't sound like you experienced very many challenges um, with the brand. Yes, you got rejected by, you know, celebrities that maybe didn't want to, you know, try and the shoe immediately and wear it and advertise for you or whatever. Just, you know, for me, I'd like to just know what are some of the, you know, key challenges you, you experienced, you, experience, uh, you know, trying to, you know, build your brand and have people wear the sneaker and everything. Yeah. I think the key challenge with the vision that I had at the time was how do I communicate the story? And how do I position it? So it was trial and error. So there's, there's, I tried a few things to communicate the story. I tried a few things to get the brand out there, you know, because I had an, I had an accounting background, you know. So I, 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 I experienced a challenge in that sense that I couldn't communicate the story right away at the inception of the brand. But eventually I got it right because of, I, I was doing that. I was doing, I was packaging the shoe, I was delivering to clients, I was engaging with clients, you know, I was doing the social media one man, you know, at the time. So I got the chance to, 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 to understand what people want. So the challenge was that what I had thought with the 18 months research and development was actually not um, what people are looking for or it's not actually the facts that I've gotten from my research and development. So once in a while I had to tweak it a bit, right? So also the balance and like any other person, the patience, you know? Um, like, look, you go into business and you think, ah, that one after 10 months, I'll, I'll be in business for sure. But then it's not the case, you know? So going on and going on and going on, you know? So for me, that was, that was the most uh, key challenge. And also, I think, I always make this example for entrepreneurs. So I think a business, when you start it from paper, growing it, it's the most challenging thing to get to the vision or to get it stabilized. Example, you look at, uh, what's his name, uh, Urob, uh, the founder of Nando's. He actually did not start Nando's. Nando's was a, French, it was, it was a store owned by a guy he knew, a Portuguese restaurant. So the guy who owned the store at the time never had the vision to grow it big. Rob went and had the chicken and was like, hey, we can, make, we can grow this thing, you know, mm -hmm. we can make it big. So the guy's like, no, I mean, I'm fine with the two stores. So he bought Nando's, mm -hmm. right? So the example that I always make is this. We always want, we say, no, we're going to be good entrepreneurs or we are great entrepreneurs. Should they give you those two Nando stores? They give you two million dollars working capital. They put in office as a CEO and they say the vision is to build a, I think it's a two billion rand business in 35 years. What will be your first step in office to take Nando's to 400 stores today? If you can answer that question and if you've got a plan to do it, then maybe an entrepreneur. Do you know what I mean? So the challenge was, for me, being a one man in LX at the time, running this business, packaging the box. My first boxes, I, I mean, I printed a, a paper, white boxes, I, I stuck on the, on the thing, print, you know? <laughs> Put it there and sold it, you know what I'm saying? That to, how do I move to a point whereby it's corporatized, the value chain is oiled, you know? Because of, I haven't run a business as this big, I've never led a team of 22 people before. Even in PwC, I've never led a team of, we are a team of 22 people. I've never led such a big team before. So my challenge was that, the next right move all the time. You know, you fail sometimes, you lose, move, you lose money, you go back, you know, you get people, you know, are trying to take advantage of you because you're new in business and all of those things, you know? So what is the next right move? That was, that, till this day, we've got two stores, if I want to build 10 stores, what is the next right move? That's my everyday challenge, actually. It never stops. The next right move. Because you make mistakes, you lose money, you employ the wrong people, you know? 
But I guess it's the nature of the business. Yeah, it never stops. The challenge never stops. But with time, it gets better because you get the right people. You understand business better. You understand your own, um, your own business better. You understand your leadership skills better. You understand your weakness better, your strengths better. So it, it sort of continues, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I would say. <laughs> I, I, oh, to start with your yeah, yeah, question, um, yeah, I would say I, I, I would say Nelson Mandela, but it's 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 <laughs> yeah, he's late. You know, it would be a great honor, you know, for him to take a picture in a party, you know. Um, ish, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think P Diddy. Yeah, he inspires me. He's oh, acumen. Are you listening? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, P. Diddy, uh, P. Diddy inspires me a lot. So I think for now, if P. Diddy wears that, you know, or even Barack Obama, so it would be a great success for me, you know. Um, um, yes, we want to go international. We want to tell a proud South African story. But my plan is this. So like any other business, and I think a lot of black people don't understand this, or us, maybe with lack uh, of, of, of business experience. In business, it's, it's important to, um, to sort of scale up. But don't be too greedy with your shareholding. For you to grow and to really build a great brand, you're going to need some sort of investors and the right people in business. You know? So that's the only way you can basically scale up. And that's why the ecosystem in Africa, now there's a lot of venture capitalists, visitor mobiles and whatever. So you need the right people to scale up. So my idea is that once I perfect the value chain, I'll probably sell a stake so that we can go international you know, with the right, skill, the right stakeholders. You know? Not now. Now I just want to work around South Africa. And then obviously when I pitch the business to investors, I'd say, this is the value chain that works, this is the model, you know? And then this is how much it's worth, there's a lot of value. So I, I, I sell a stake and then we sort of, you know, um, I so diversify. Have you started that process of VC funding? And I've been approached by a lot of VCs. Series, uh, I've been approached by a lot of VCs. Of yeah, yeah, I've been approached by a lot of VCs, yeah. but goes back to my earlier point, cuts. Okay. Cuts, 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 I'm not ready. So yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a big step. It's a big step, yeah, yeah. yeah. I still want to enjoy the, the, <laughs> the peace. The, 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 yeah, the peace. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, just a quick one from myself. So, I'm looking at the, at the brand and the business. Uh, the average is uh, 5 million. Sure. Yeah. So, I'm like, how do you guys manage? How does your enthusiasm match the beat in terms of how do you control your enthusiasm? Sure. In terms of, because you are, you, you guys are based on it. Mm hmm And then you guys are in a position of the business. Yeah. The business. Yeah. So how do you now control the, the ideas, the ideas? Because that was the pressure. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah. So how do you guys uh, planning to control it? So yeah. It's very critical. I think in most of the business, they, 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 they flow up or they, they mm. flow up. Mm, mm, mm. So, so, so that's how I, I really want to get the, yeah. the, the formula of the system that you have. Good question. So actually, with the pressure thing, yeah, um, and, and, and I'm lucky enough, I'm one person who's not impulsive. So we get, we get a lot of pressure from our clients to open stores everywhere. You know, they would say, oh, we need a store in Polukan, we need, no. <laughs> so I, I don't make decisions like that. I don't make decisions on, on demand. You know, I don't, I don't run a business that is on demand. The product is on demand. Business is something else. The value chain is something else. The process is something else. The mesh edition is on demand. Not, not the business that I'm trying to build, something else. So, actually, I heard this from Vosi as well. The one mistake that we make as entrepreneurs is not investing in the value chain. The whole process, the value chain of building a proper business, corporatizing it, having the right people in, 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 in business, um, the right accountants, the right attorneys, the right IT guy, the right human resource guy in business. You need to master that first. Because the thing is this, product guys or services, you can always innovate. People are thinking anytime. We can innovate a different type of a shoe. But our shoe, our business is not mainly on the product. We need to optimize our value chain once we get the value chain, we're going to be able to innovate faster. We're going to be able to act faster. You know, the reason why 
you, you can't really, Batu can't really compete with Nike South Africa now. Because Nike South Africa has got the value chain on point from distribution to their back office to everything else, right? They probably have accountants that have been working for them for 40 years, lawyers for 30 years, for Nike South Africa, the corporate, that are working on the value chain every day. So for me, personally, yes, we've got a lot of ideas, but we're not going to move fast. Because if we move fast with the right, without the right value chain that is optimized, we're going to crash. But when the value chain is right, the value chain is right. An instance, businesses don't compete on products. They compete on value chains. Two classic examples, clicks and this cam. Apparently, this cam has got the best products ever. But clicks value chain is too strong. You find clicks everywhere. Clicks, you can get a cube about it, turning like this. It moves. Same applies with macro. A queue, like, it moves because their value chain, their systems are optimized. That's why sometimes now this can find it hard to compete with what? With clicks. Because the value chains are different. Value chains for clicks and macro are the most efficient value chains ever. So for me, not to lose momentum, hence I, not to say I don't care about the product, the mesh edition, but I care more about building the value chain because that's one thing that's going to sustain me forever making sure that the working capital is there, making sure that the right people are in business. For instance, look at Fila, look at Kappa. Mm. They're only coming back now. How did they survive the years? <laughs> the value chain that they've built. Because of the, the Fila for Kappa, they were quiet, my man, for the longest of time. Yeah. Now all of a sudden, Rick Rick blocks Kappa, then it's trendy. <laughs> Fila, but how did they survive? The value chain. They've got accountants, they've got attorneys, they've got the working capital. They can, they can pay salaries for the next three years while they're still thinking of a nice innovative project or a marketing uh, plan to come back. They've been quiet. Now LS is coming back. This hip hop guy is rocking and LS is back in business. How did they survive for the rest of the time? Because of, they did not compete about products. The value chain, they still make the same clothes. Mm. The same filler shirt, they, put a, they still put a filler logo on it. You know? Then how did they survive? Now these cool kids on Instagram, they're looking Fila, they're looking Kappa. So how did they survive the past years when they were quiet? The value chain. They invested in the value chain, the systems. You can pay us, you've got enough money to pay your salaries for the next three years. You know, you've got enough money to pay your rent. You've got enough money not to rechange. You've got enough money, even enough money to play around product development to develop different types of product, testing. You've got about 20 million lying there, you just wasted on product development and a cool idea, you know? That type of thing. Now, if you focus on the brand and trending and the hype, then all of a sudden, consumers are not reliable. They move to the next one. Then you don't have money, you don't have the right value chain. You know? Then your business collapse. The next part two. Yeah, the next part two. They, 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 um, I mean, startup boards, they, they've been running the laws before they close for the longest of time. How do they pay their rent? How do they pay their employees? Same applies with Edgar's, because the value chain, you know? So for me, that's why now we're corporatizing the business, so that I can build uh, an efficient, optimized value chain. Yeah. And also, that's why I don't sell, because of, I want to sell to venture capitalists once it's optimized and efficient. Yeah. Oil. Yeah. Is there another question, man? Sure, sure, sure Fede. Sure, sure. Sure, sure. Oh, la. Thanks, thanks, Yeah. I think it's a very difficult industry to build a mainstream record. Mm. There's a lot of competition. Sure. Especially for major retailers. Yeah. Yeah. South, yeah, yeah. Another thing is if you're going to build a a brand, especially in South Africa, where you're not necessarily a consumer society, mm. in pocket money. Sure. You know what I mean? Uh, so we saw this thing is good, you know, it's difficult. The question is real. So, so where do you think the root cause are in terms of our startup brand? Mm. Not only fashion, but our startup brand, where mm. the root cause are. I think it goes to my previous point for me, and then I think maybe I would say I, I was privileged enough to have corporate experience, and I've seen how, because, because product is one thing, 
business is another. The value chain and how you run your business. Yes, it might be a, a fashion brand or whatever, but there should be a back office behind it, you know? So oftentimes, I, I believe that the weakness comes in having a product that is too hyped, but not having anything to back it up, the back office behind it, you know? So, and I always tell people this, that with our brand, I was very specific about it, that my, our vision is not to be a fashion brand. Listen to this, we want to be, and I'm specific about it, we want to be a shoe retail brand. We want to build our own products, our own sneaker care products, sell them at our, or retail them at our own retail stores. I declined the Studio 88 deal. I declined an Edgar's deal simply because I want to build my own ecosystem, my own value chain, my own products in my own stores. Reason being is that if you look at Eldo, the way they position themselves as a shoe brand, you know, or an, a little bit of accessory, that's, that's their mainstream thing. So I want to build a shoe brand that Africans can proudly affiliate with, with our own retail stores. If Speeds can come with one store in 1994 in Carlton Center, Batu can come in one store in Italy in the year 2020, yeah. and we sort of build up from that. So that's my vision. You know what I'm saying? So brand positioning as well. And like my previous point, the value chain. I mean, the, the people who run restaurants here, they will, the owner of the restaurant will tell you the importance of the value chain. Do you know what I mean? So I think that's the most important thing. If the value chain is all is optimized, then you can survive. You can survive copyrights. I mean, Mr. Price copies everyone. <laughs> they copy everyone. And then, going sorry, my sister, I want to address this point. So the advantage of, me, of not being a fashion brand, this is it. So you look at Mr. Price, you look at Zara, you look at Hulwets. They are fashion brands, right? Fashion retail brands. They work on seasons. You won't find a long product in Mr. Price for the longest of time. Two, three months, they move it out of the shelf because they, they're working on hype, right? So if you're only selling a shoe like this, they can copy you, but they'll move it out of the shelf because they've made their targets, they've made their money, they move on to the next thing. So for me, now strictly what? Shoes or sneakers. That's how I position myself differently. Fashion brands, Mr. Price, two, three months, they sell this item because it's trendy and they move it out of the shelf. They move it to the shelf. Those are fashion brands. For me, I'm a shoe retail brand. So that's how I position myself differently. And I'm protecting myself against, you know, um, uh, being co or not really being copied, but the sustainability of the business, you know, so that I can be sustainable. So that's how I position myself, you know? Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense or that answers the question. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to see a shoe that says I'm Yeah. 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 There's so much that you can use. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. No, um, to, to, can I add a point? Partner with the Endo. Yeah. <laughs> you can see this is a suit blanket. Sure, sure. So it's a, it's a new brand. Then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely, definitely. Just to add a point to, to, to that, my sister, thank you so much. Ne? Uh, and I just want to say this. Um, with the vision to be a shoe retail brand, um, we, we, we've got a portfolio of designs that incorporates exactly what you said, right? But because of the timing of it, I mean, now I'm wearing the Jane edition, which is coming up in, um, in, in April, right? This is our, we've got about, when we counted, 69 designs. But we're only selling on one design, the mesh edition. This is going to be the second of the 69 in the portfolio. And on that portfolio, part of it is exactly what you, what you explained. But the timing of it, you know? So with the brand, you need to take enough time to build the brand identity. Make an example with All Star. All Star survived with one design for the longest of time, till this day. Nike Cortez, you know, or Nike Amex. It's been a long design that is their primary uh, product that sells. They just keep on re-innovating it and stuff like that. So that's what makes a brand, brand identity. So for us, we're going to stick with a few designs for now, for the longest of time, so that we can build the brand identity. The identity. Once we, the identity is strong, we're going to keep on, you know, um, um, introducing other types of designs. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent.
question. Shosh, what's it? Shosh, shosh. Yeah. And I know the biggest thing is funding. Mm, right. True. So I wanted to just quickly touch on uh, your first sort of big transaction. Yeah. Giving away yeah. If you have, um, because what I'm trying to get is how much equity you give away in the early stage and how do you evaluate that transaction? Yeah. And to who and what kind? Yeah. What get? Yeah. You know, yeah. So I, I think, um, just to answer the last bit of your question, um, and I think that's why I haven't sold, because I also haven't figured it out as yet, you know, the right way of doing it. I'm still learning about it, so that the minute I start having those conversations with VCs, you know, or potential investors, I would be clued up, and, because sometimes, remember, these guys, they use technical words, and then the next thing you, you know, you puzzle a bit. So because of, I'm working, so I'm thinking forward, basically. I know at what stage I want to sell, once I've achieved certain KPIs. While I'm not there yet, but I'm educating myself about um, uh, venture capital deals. For, ex for instance, I'm studying a lot about the biggest transactions that as I have happened in the finance industry, the biggest things, you know, what were the facts around it, you know? So that when I start having this conversation with these guys, I've got facts, I, I understand the game. Do you know what I mean? And that's why now with this approach and offers, I'm not selling because I'm not clued up as yet. But in the meantime, I'm educating myself. So that when they get into that boardroom, who's informed, and I'm going to match their, the conversation. Do you know what I mean? And the thing of investing in village chain, I think it's the hardest thing ever. Corporatizing in the business. Till this day, we stress about it every single day because you're using your own money to build a village chain. Because remember, village chain is... It's something that's going to get you money and value in a long time, but you can't see the results now, like paying salaries, employing the right people, and doing whatever, right? So it's the hardest thing ever, you know? So for us, um, I think we're privileged enough to build enough working capital, you know, to be able to invest some of it in stock, to pay salaries, and to still have some sort of funds available to run the business, right? But other than that, it's not that easy to get to that point. Hence, we we never open our, uh, the stores immediately. We build, we build, we, we make sure that we've got enough facility to keep the stock, we've got the right people, we've got delivery vehicles, you know, we've got suppliers. Then we're like, okay, now, with this little bit of money that, is, that we've got, with these assets, with these people, then let's open a store. And if we do open a store, will we be able to pay the salaries for the next six months? Will we be able to, you know, to, to pay the rent and stuff like that? So it's a tricky situation when you don't have it, when you have to build the money yourself and use your own money, you know? So, but with timing and comes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. last question and then... Oh, yeah, I guess Yeah, just one. Yeah. I just want to find out if Yeah, so... <laughs> so, so, so we've got two stores. Uh, we've, got, we've got two stores at the moment uh, in, in Newtown Junction the mall, and then we've got one in Pretoria, in Helen Joseph. We're opening a third one in PE uh, in, in, in April. Alternatively, we're launching, actually, that's a good question, we're launching our online store tomorrow. E-commerce. So, yeah, e-commerce, www.patu.co. Uh, so, you can get it there. Yeah. You heard it here first, people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, who's with the program? Yeah. Yeah. Who's up with access? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Or would you say, it's better to say, you know what, I, I, I'm going to stick with the quality of my brand, and because I believe in it, people are going to buy it at exactly the price that I'm putting it out for. Would you say, no, you also experience that, and you, you would say or advise, mm. that it's better sometimes if it's stacking on, you know, coming out and marketing. Mm. Okay, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, so, <clears throat> for me personally, with my journey, 
with the proven concept. There was a reason why I did the proven concept. I made, I made a loss, like I said. People still owe me money for the proven concept. I was actually told by <laughs> my, the, the person that I was dating at the time. And that's why, <laughs> that, that, that's why, <laughs> <laughs> That's why sometimes you gotta be careful of your circle and people that you spend time with. Actually, my then ex girlfriend, when because of I was working late night and push, hey baby, you know, you talk. So I, he, she told me that people won't pay 800 rand for my sneakers, they're too expensive. Uh, but I believed, like you say believe in it and pushed it and i'm and indeed you can imagine they told me that people are not going to pay for it and i made a loss with the proof of concept do you know what i'm saying so i could have easily said yo and maybe she was right you know <laughs> then maybe i need to make a plan maybe this thing is not working but i didn't because i believed do you know what i mean then i i, I, and I, I was consistent with it i was really really consistent with with just that and another thing is about the patience so Ever since I left PwC and focused on the business, the biggest lesson that I've learned in business, and I wanna really, I'm gonna try to be specific about this and articulate it better. One of the things, and I think a lot of people struggle with it, in business, I think it's important to know what works for you. Just this week, SA Fashion Week called me three times, saying we should be on the floor. But that thing does not work for me. And one might say, the cool kids, Yo, bro, SA Fashion is big. It does not work for my business. Do you know what I mean? I rather, you know, spend my time and energy trying to discuss a collaboration with Sumizi or Sumizi Inspired, because that works for me. So it's important in business to understand what works for you. That's why now I don't waste time. This thing, meetings, meetings, mm -hmm. coffee meetings and whatever, not, not in a bad way, but the time is precious. Know what works for you. Don't just go and go with the flow and, you know. So you need to find the balance of what works for you and stick with it. Tell you this, we did online for the longest of time and we were discouraged with opening stores because people were like, no, retail space is, is going the other way, startup port is closing, save the rent, save the rent, whatever. But bro, we opened our first store in Newtown Junction. We tripled our profits. And people were coming from Sprays, from Soweto, to from Val. And I had a chat with these guys and I was like, but my the brand has been there for a long time. You just here running to the clue. Why are you why are you only buying the shoe now? Why is this your first pair? You could have bought it, we've been doing deliveries. Ah time man, this thing of online thing. I mean I fool in Do you know what I mean? So for the longest of time, because of obviously the opinions that I've that I got, I thought retail stores won't work. But then I opened the store in in, in Jersey. Sales report. I opened the store in Pretoria. We went above. Even the Yoko guys called us. They said, "Guys, what are you selling? Like this is this is insane. Yeah, this is insane. Machines broke up. Like they, they, the service is corrupted because the amount of transactions, you know. But for the longest of time, I never thought because I was under the impression that it does not work. Then I started understanding that no one works. So for me, rather wasting time on doing SA Fashion Week or collaborations that maybe don't benefit me that much. I rather invest time in building a relationship with growth point properties for the retail space, negotiating better lease, you know what I'm saying? Those type of things, you know? Um, with property, whatever the property companies are, building a relationship so that I can get a better uh, um, a, a spot at the mall. So that when they're opening a mall, I can get a better, you know? Or product development, you know? And then with this journey design, it was also inspired, obviously we had the design already in the portfolio, but conversations that we had with clients, what they want. I'd rather spend time with listening to clients as to what they want. They said, no, mesh edition is good, but we want a cover-up shoe, we want a shoe like this, a shoe like this. Hence, we invented this. So spend time on things that works for your brand. Product development is key. Steve Jobs dedicated most of his time in product development. The look and feel of Apple, in you know, being innovative, that's what he was passionate about. Do you know what I mean? Because it worked. You know what I mean? So you have to know what works. So if maybe, to answer your question, you're struggling with selling a product, try to understand the dynamics of it. It's probably maybe simple things like packaging. Sorry, like packaging. That makes your product not to move. Or your way of selling, you know? So try to spend time on what works than devaluing your product.
Yeah, because once you devalue, you keep it there, people buy it, then when you, it's going to be a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, you don't ask this guy enough questions. No. I, <laughs> you just want to show off. Uh, I, know. Okay. Sorry, I, I know you guys said it's the last question. Um, yeah. but my question is based on entrepreneurship and business owners. So, my question to you is here is what's the difference between a business owner and an entrepreneur? Yeah. And what do you classify yourself as? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that guy has been backing that question. <laughs> Ah, uh, because this guy asked it, I don't know, my guy. Yeah, know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, I think I would say an entrepreneur, this is, for me, I had this. It's yeah. actually not my answer. I'm just quoting someone who said this. And I think it blew my mind. Mm. Entrepreneurs are the best coordinators. A person who can take a tissue and get someone to sell it and someone to, you know, and, and position how you can sell it. For me, I think that's basically a definition of an entrepreneur, the best coordinators. Business owners, I think... Um, I think it's a fancy term for CEO, CEO or, or having shares in a business, you know what I'm saying, or owning something, something like that, or having value in something. Those are business owners. But entrepreneurs, um, I mean, they would, see, they would sell you something that is not there, and then they won't even do the work themselves, but they would coordinate the right people to do it, or coordinate the right resources, you know, to get it done. So for me, I think entrepreneurs are the best coordinators. <laughs> I mean, I'm an yes. entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I think yeah. on that note, um, I think the last question I, I left with you was to say, um, to give a message yeah. that kid, who was chilling, yeah. who maybe sees this somewhere on YouTube one day and it's like, yeah. Yeah. because of what this guy said, this I'm is going what to do X, Y, Z. I think, personally, the approach, not only to business, in my view, a lot of people get it wrong in life because oftentimes we given the society, given the pressures that we get from school, our teachers, uh, our parents, we often, the issue that, the, the one thing that they always address, it's success, it's you know, making it in life, making them proud or whatever, right? The biggest mistake that a lot of people make is that not investing in self-awareness in your identity. If you can master that, who you are, then success won't be a big issue. Because then you would know who you are. You would know your identity, your character. So the reason why there's so many, you know, unfortunate things that are happening, things that are, people not getting it right, people having depression, people, you know, having pressure from whoever, is because they don't know who they are. And the society says, success, success, own a business, be a CA, medical doctor, do this, do this, drive this car, do whatever. Whereas the most important thing is investing in your character, your identity, and being very patient. If you can master self, I tell you your time, you, you can master anything. Then when you master self, you find something that works for you, that you like in doing, and you just do that. Black Coffee just plays music, man. Man. Can you play music? Black I can Coffee play music. Coffee I can play, play music. music. Black Coffee just plays music. How many people play music? Yeah. And, and Black Coffee could have gotten a radio show at Metro mm. anytime or whatever. But he probably doesn't want to do that. He can actually put a proposal to Metro. They can give him a show. But he probably doesn't. He wants to play music. And because of his mastered self, you know, he can master his passion. Another thing, with the danger of social media, patience, patience, patience. Mm. The Instagram life is dangerous. The Instagram life is dangerous. Stay away from that. Be careful about it. Master your own self. And when you're at peace with yourself, then you can master whatever passion that you've got. That's, that's my value in life. So society preaches otherwise. They preach success before self-awareness and character. Whereas I think if, even it's cool if they focus on character and identity, then you would decide what you want. They don't have to tell you to be a doctor. They don't have to tell you to be a CA. They don't have to sort of put pressure on you to say you have to be a civil engineer, you're good with science or whatever. You, if you master self, you would know what you enjoy and you pursue what you enjoy. So that's my view. So we, I think we got it wrong a lot of times. Even our parents, they focus on whatever. You know? People are pastors today. They wake people from dead. They're making hey. money. Because maybe they, maybe they realize, uh, this, is, this is what I can do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so that's, yeah. That's, that's my advice. Just master self. Thank you so, yeah. so much, my man. Let's give the guy a hand. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, personally,
personally for me, anyone who was listening, um, gain something. And if you didn't, then watch the video because you'll gain something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and if you didn't still, then, I, then, then maybe no. <laughs> but uh, guys, thank you all for coming tonight. And yeah. Thank you, my thanks, brother. Thanks, 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 my brother. <laughs> that for was lovely. Thank you. So I, I take it this is the, the first covered shoe. Yeah, this is the first covered shoe. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We don't even have All content right. of so this shoe. So now there's no breathing now. No, there's no breathing. Oh. <laughs> 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 All right, guys. Thank you all so much. Drive safe, guys. Get home safe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then maybe we'll see you at the next startup drive. Yeah. Sure. Okay, exciting guys. <laughs> yeah. Sure, Martine. Thanks for the invite. Hola. Thank you so sure. much. Sure. Thanks, ne. Hola.